Welcome back. Thank you, Sister Marion, and thank you, Mr. Jim Brett. Good to be with you. <laughs> Good to be with you, Father. Thank you so much. Your, your presence is always uh, kind of a joy for all of us here. You, you bring light wow. into our studios and our hallways. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Thank you. Yeah. Tell my wife that. She still tells me <laughs> to take the trash out. Don't forget. <laughs> So. so I got to ask you a question before yeah. we get started, because I, I'm just curious about this. So I know of the President's Committee right. uh, for People with Intellectual Disabilities, right. and also we're going to talk about the National Council on Disability. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us the relationship between sure. those, if any? President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities are appointments made by the President, and you are uh, uh, required really to report to the President uh, once a year a report and uh, a recommendation maybe that the President may not be aware of. So um, that has been in existence since uh, President Kennedy, who really established it back in the 1960s. And uh, the National Council of Disability was established in the late uh, 1980s, and it's an independent federal agency. And uh, we have nine members that are appointed, five by the President of the United States. One is appointed by the Speaker of the House. The Speaker has chosen me, and I'm very grateful. The minority leader, which is the Republican leader of the House, has one appointment. And then uh, the majority leader in the Senate and the minority leader in the Senate has uh, each one member. So nine members, five by the President, four by Congress. But we are an independent uh, agency, uh, and we're funded by Congress. But uh, our job really is to look at all the statutes, look at all the policies, look at all the practices, look at all the regulations, and see if we can make any uh, recommendations to the President, his administration, and members of Congress. And what are the particular needs at, at this moment in history uh, in our country, uh, especially for people with disabilities? Yeah. Believe it or not, we're approaching the 30th anniversary of the uh, ADA, the American Disability Act. We've made major progress, which is wonderful to say the least, uh, in employment and housing and what have you. But one of the biggest issues, believe it or not, for people with disabilities is access to dental care. We do not have enough dentists that will take care of people with disabilities because, first of all, it may take an awful lot of time for a dentist to, uh, to treat an individual who's Down syndrome or intellectually challenged, and the reimbursement rate is not all that great. So um, we've been working with dental schools uh, throughout the United States to change their curriculum to make sure that every dentist is, is uh, able to be trained to uh, diagnose and treat people with disabilities. Because believe it or not, there are many, many uh, individuals that just cannot find access to dental care. And uh, in the year 2020, that's a disgrace. And tell me now, uh, a kid that grew up on Savin Hill, Right, right. Uh, a family man, a Catholic state yeah. representative. Right. Um, what is it personally for you that uh, attracts you uh, to be concerned for people who struggle with disabilities? It all started uh, with my brother. My brother Jack, uh, the oldest in the family, born in 1934. Uh, my mother uh, from Ireland, um, <clears throat> sixth grade education, here only for a few years, has a young a child, a first child, and uh, very difficult pregnancy. Doctor says to my mother that, uh, let us take your son. He will not live long. It's 1934. We'll put him in an institution, a roof over his head, three meals a day. He will not live long, but the burden will be lifted from you. And while I have you here, uh, I'd advise you not to have other children. Again, a woman from Northwest Ireland, Sligo, sixth grade education, said to the doctor, one, my son will be coming home, I'll have more children. He will be part of their life, and they will be part of his life. Today, we call that, uh, in the disability community, uh, community inclusion, bringing people with disability into the community. Here's a woman in 1934 who brought that, uh, that term to life. Hmm. So when he was uh, born, um, he did not have what we have today all of these wonderful programs for housing and employment and, and uh, you know, other services and support services. And I learned, even though he had an IQ of maybe 35, 36, he became my teacher. He became my teacher who opened my eyes mm. and my heart to the issue of disabilities, where I said, I'm, I'm watching somebody live with disabilities. And uh, made a commitment to my mother that if I were successful in elected office, I'd be the voice for people who have no voice. And uh, when I left office, 
uh, Governor Jane Swift, who was the acting governor at the time, asked me to be the chairman of the Governor's Commission uh, for people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, I've been doing that for 19 years for four different governors. And, and um, President Bush was kind enough to appoint me to the President's Committee. And then President Obama was kind enough to appoint me chairman of the President's Committee. And Speaker of the House appointed me to the National Council of Disability. But it all began with my brother, Jack. And the strength of your, your mother. My mother is an extraordinary woman. Yeah. She was my Obviously. mentor. Wow. And my brother was my teacher. My mother was my mentor. Just quickly to shift a little bit, uh, the, the issue of uh, it's always looming on the horizon, assisted suicide, physician-assisted yes. suicide. Yeah. Isn't that fraught with opportunities for abuse? Absolutely. We have about eight, I think believe we have, we have eight states that have assisted suicide laws, and they're really uh, modeled after uh, Oregon, you know, uh, dying with dignity. And uh, we also have the District of Columbia that has assisted suicide law. And more states are looking at it. But people with intellectual disabilities, that's part of the report that we did on National Council of Disability. Anybody wants to see the report, just go on www.ncd.gov. You can get the, the complete report. But basically what we did, we examined uh, people who live in these states that have the assisted suicide, who live with disability. And quite frankly, it was chilling, the, the response that we got from some of these people in there. Um, I think we're going into sliding the slope, uh, the, the rope is getting uh, slippery and uh, the quality of life is, uh, is becoming even uh, less significant. In Oregon, for instance, uh, now if you're a diabetic or if you have arthritis, you have access to the medication and believe it or not, people will say, well, you have to understand the number one reason why people would look at uh, asking for the medication and the end of life drug is because of the pain. This study has indicated that if you look at the five reasons why people will choose end of life through the medication, pain is not one of them. What it is really is a burden, a burden with their family, or losing their independence. That's why I say the people with disabilities, their biggest barriers, they, they lack support and services. And this piece of legislation might make it easier for them just to terminate their life because there'll be some people out there who will say, you have, you have an unsatisfactory life style. You may want to choose this. That is very dangerous. And that's why we put this report out saying people with disabilities, they don't really have people with a voice. And that's why it's important to put the red flags out there to protect these people because what they do need is they need services, they need support, because they do not get the health care that other people get. For instance, again, in Oregon, which is the model uh, of the assisted suicide, in Oregon, you know, they had so many people who had long-term medical depression and uh, talked about assisted suicide. Of all those people who took the medication, the end of life, only 1.8% of those people actually had a psychological test. Mm. That's frightening. And also that that state alone, now that you have assisted suicide, they're 21% higher than any other state in the country. So is this what we're leading to yeah. with people with disabilities? Well, thank you for raising that issue with us and also reminding us to go to ndc.gov to learn more about the National Council on right. Disability. Right. And may I be the first one, I'm a little yes. early, to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. The green tie <laughs> made me think of that. Okay, thank you very much. Jim Brett, thank you so much.